Hello and welcome to this video on making alcohol with milk. There is an expression that goes, any port in a storm. It approximates using anything that works when no other option or alternative exists, even if it's a bad option. A typical example we talk about alcohol would be rice or potatoes, and these make sake and vodka respectively. Despite there being a not inconsiderable amount of human ingenuity when it comes to making our species' favourite social lubricant, uh, not every culture has been so blessed or fortunate enough to have access to a uh, stable staple plant, fruit or vegetable, or similar that can be used in producing alcohol. This is where the next, uh, let's say, most common source of fermentable sugars comes into play. For all intents and purposes, dairy, but specifically milk and in that lactose. Unlike fruit, vegetables and grain-based alcohol, dairy-based alcohol is rather different and verges on unique. In less polite language, this is not something for everybody, and it has a very acquired taste in some cases. Fermenting milk-based products is not necessarily a new phenomenon. It was, at least in part, what drove the Mongolian and Hunnic hordes in their angry rampage across Europe. It was, admittedly, one of humanity's earliest alcoholic frat party beverages, and dozens if not hundreds of other cultural applications of fermented milk that you can find just about across the world. Well, for starters, we can split milk-based alcohol into two groups, distilled and non-distilled. Since distilling requires some alcohol to begin with, we'll start with non-distilled milk-based alcoholic beverages. The first step in making milk-based alcohol is to start making cheese. While wine and cheese go hand in hand, cheese and milk alcohol maybe not so much. Despite this, you do need to separate the curds and whey. You do this either with rennet, which is the most reliable approach, or with a mild acid like vinegar, which requires considerably more finesse and therefore is less common. The curds are mostly protein and lipids, essentially protein and fat. The whey is mostly water, some lipids, some protein, and a lot of water-soluble sugars, like lactose. The reason for this is somewhat obvious. If you keep the milk whole, it will rot and not ferment, and we have a whole video on that distinction. And to make this a suitable substrate for fermenting, you need a lot of sugar, but a little of the other things for the most part. The whey fits this much better than whole milk or curds. We will touch on how to use them, but for the most part, doing it this way, you get two products, not one, with little to no loss in volume of alcohol, and you get a fairly high production of cheese. With your whey split from your curds, it should look rather like a murky water or really diluted light milk. You can consider the process started at this point. To some extent, if you were to go from here, you don't actually need to do anything else if you're going to do this the uh, all-natural way. That is, you leave your whey out in the open air and see if it starts to bubble. This is also a good way to get food poisoning, so uh, let's be a little more systematic. And now, for the yeast itself, well, you've already realised that we kind of skipped over that before, and there's a good reason why we've done that. The typical cerevisiae yeast used in brewing doesn't quite work as you would hope for this. You need something that can metabolise lactose. Lactose is made up of galactose and glucose, whereas your others, say sucrose or table sugar, is fructose and sucrose. But glucose is a very common one, and having two glucoses together gives you maltose, the major thing in malt. In terms of what you're actually going to use, you can try and source a dedicated yeast strain for this, but a lot of people have already done the work for you, so you don't actually need to go out hunting this down. In fact, one of the better options is going to be, say, the uh, Clovera romaces marxianus, and it's able to ferment lactose, which is that main thing we mentioned being in milk that's sugar. Fortunately, like, say, sucrose, maltose, and similar, a lactose being made up of two subunits means you get essentially two alcohol molecules from each single molecule of sugar, so to say. It's not quite the right, uh, let's say, uh, chemical speaking language, but for make this easy, let's just say one lactose unit makes two alcohol units because it gets broken in half. Doing it this way, you can get anywhere between three and in some cases up to 8% alcohol by volume because of how much lactose and various other sugars are in milk and can be broken down. Now, you can also try the approach of whole milk, but uh, this is more akin to a buttermilk or similar than an 
actual fermented alcohol initially. You add a bacterial culture to your whole milk, as you would for butter and similar cheeses, but also a lot of yeast. And over time, the milk will begin to split, and this will end up with curds and whey. So you've essentially done the same thing you would with rennet, but slightly more complicated. The whey is actually alcoholic and can be siphoned off and produces an alcoholic-like beverage, along with something very close to a precursor to cheese. Now, the way you siphon off should be pasteurized, just in case, as it is very bacteria and yeast rich, and, well, it hasn't necessarily been fermented under the most controlled of conditions. To make this yeast, and in fact you can use this with the other method as well, a more effective and prolific is by adding extra sugar. Whether this is sucrose or table sugar, honey, or your other choice of fermentable sugar, it's up to you. This is arguably the more traditional approach to making fermented milk in some parts of the world, and particularly the Eurasian steppes, but it's also somewhat more, uh, not necessarily unreliable, but uh, certainly not necessarily the best option. And now for some of the more technical details, which are kind of important for this, because although you don't necessarily need to know what's happening, knowing what's happening helps you to fix some issues that are going to come up once you encounter them. Now, in terms of whey, because of what it is and how it is, it's actually going to have a pH level that's not really very uh, conducive to fermentation, and for simple reasons, it's rather acidic. Lactose becomes lactic acid under certain circumstances, and because of that you need to add something alkaline or basic to it. Now, what you use will be up to you, but it's going to vary drastically. Uh, things like, for example, uh, calcium carbonate are often a good choice, but Depending on what you want to do in the flavors and so on, it's very much up for you to decide. But that works for a certain way. Now, let's say you use, for example, a uh, whole milk or a very rich milk. Sometimes this can produce a sweet whey. That is a, a whey that's got a lot more sugar in it. But this also tends to have a less acid in it, meaning it's slightly better and you may not need to do as much to modify it. On the other hand, acidic whey tends to be from, let's say, a lighter milk, things like, say, a parmesan. Trying to make that and turn the whey from that into alcoholic beverages is arguably going to be a lot more challenging. And of course, you want to try and remove as many of the solids, impurities, and similar from the whey as possible, preferably by filtering it through something like, say, cheesecloth, a strainer, or similar. The conditions for fermenting are a little more important. As I've already mentioned, you have trouble with the yeast strain, so you need to be careful in selecting the right one. If you don't, you're going to have a lot of problems with just the fermentation and, well, metabolism of lactose. But you're also going to get a lot of changes in flavor and certainly a lot of changes in alcohol content, so bear that in mind. Next is temperature. Now, we would argue that it's best to try and ferment this at a lower temperature, only because you are essentially working with a derivative of dairy products. So lower temperature means you have a better chance of being able to get positive results. But you don't want it to be so cold that yeast stops working entirely. And finally, aeration can be beneficial in this case. Mostly because we're not talking about yeast strains that have been as well developed and well selected for a very long time frame, and therefore they're not necessarily as good at alcohol production. But you also don't want to have too much oxygen, so it's more of a balancing act with that. With that said, we can now go on to the other kinds of fermented milk products, the distilled kind, because that's essentially one of the things you can do from here. You can either consume things as they are, which can be interesting, or you can basically produce something very similar to, say, a whiskey or a vodka. It will vary somewhat based on exactly how you distill, but the end results are going to be basically one of those two categories. After you've produced your alcoholic product of fermentation, it's the wash. You then distill it, and this is the same as just about every other kind of distillation that's out there. You go in, you put your wash into your massive still, preferably some sort of thing over the surface of it or in as a treatment to prevent excessive bubbling, and so basically something to break up the surface tension, and then you slowly bring it up to temperature. Now, it depends on what you're going to do here, whether you do a column still or a pot still. Pot still, you make fractions or cuts, and these will then be mixed and combined later on, and then you'll probably put them in some sort of barrel or you'll oak them somehow. If it's a column still, you're probably going to try and throw away the first, say, 100 milliliters because that's probably going to have methanol. It, not necessarily, but better safe than sorry, or safe than blind. And the rest of it's basically consumable as vodka. But 
that's not necessarily the only things you can do. Remembering that you can either make it as a direct consumable thing, a distilled thing, or you can try and create some sort of interesting and exciting blends. It's going to be up to you. It's not necessarily a beverage that's going to uh, fuel your rampage of raping and pillaging across the Eastern European steppes and into Europe, but it's also not going to help in maintaining uh, Chechen or Georgian freedom fighters. It is, however, a fun and novel form of beverage to try next time you think that milk is getting awfully close to its use-by date, you see an exceptionally good deal on whole milk, or you make cheese and think, what do I do with the leftover whey other than stewing it, using it for animal feed, or putting it into the rubbish can or down the sink? Admittedly, this is not for everybody, and it's certainly worth trying once, if nothing else, then it's interesting, uh, but you may not want to try it a second time. Well, thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. And please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.